Thank you. Thank you for being here. Shall we go into what A Course in Miracle is and what its lifestyle is? <coughs> I think we need to make acquaintance with the action of A Course in Miracle. What it is beyond, yes, the about. Because it will impart a great deal to us. And like everything, it might also offer a lot of challenges. We see that the Course emerged out of two people, Dr. Helen Shukman and Dr. Bill Tetford. They were both psychiatrists at the Columbia University and rather renowned and extremely uh, Bill Thetford was a gentleman, very kind, well-contained, poised person. Kind of a perfect gentleman and very knowledgeable. And Dr. Helen Shukman was extremely bright, beyond the brain. She was as swift as lightning and you can't define her that she was polite and nice. You can't define her that she was a re... Whatever you like to say is all right. She was reactive. She could be mad. She could be angry. She could be compassionate. It doesn't fit anything the human brain can know who she, who she was and who she is. And therefore, to define her, it would take much longer time. And then we don't have any reference point to a person like that. Can you see, when I say Bill Thetford was a gentleman, we see that there must be some refined person, well-contained, not reactive, would allow you the space, and had something to say, and would only then say it. You know, and not bias, and so on, willing, having the space to hear. About Helen Shukman, you couldn't describe what Melchizedek was like, could you? <laughs> she was beyond definitions, and therefore very confusing. We want to pinpoint somebody, and then we are satisfied as if you know them. So she could turn you totally off. And human nature being what it is, when she turns you to completely off, you're not going to see your impurities, your own petty-mindedness. or how judgmental you are, and how she must conform to being a gentle lady like he is a gentleman. Isn't it? She doesn't play those roles. Are you glad you're listening to something that you never knew before? These people are unpredictable. It's a horror you don't want to go near. <laughs> it's like a shark just gets you, you know. One of the main function is to push those buttons. And we want conformity. We think a saint, a holy person, Jesus should behave this way. <laughs> Going around behind the temple, uh, throwing the tables over, attacking the money changers, oh, ah, it's all right, isn't that nice, we have one example, what would you say, mad, he's so angry, so reactive, <laughs> yeah, 
it's unbelievable when we can't hear a fact as a fact. It's very disturbing to hear a fact as a fact. It's not everyone's tease. If you're attached, obsessed with your point of view, you're going to be miserable. So these two people came together in the Vertical Columbia University. And she's also Hebrew background. So uh, they worked together and they were, you know, extremely uh, bright, especially uh, Dr. Shukman. When she first met him, uh, the encounter goes this way, that Bill Thetford uh, is the head of this department and he needed somebody to help him, an assistant, you may call it. And some mutual friends said, well, I know a, a lady, you know, she was very good and so on and so forth. And uh, that was Dr. Shukman. So he talked with, with her and uh, she ex accepted it and showed up at the office. And no sooner she saw him, she said, he's the one I'm to help. And now we want to know what the f Course in Miracle is. You have to know that this person knows. She's not pretentious. This is the one I'm to help. Built that for Now let us see someone let, who extends help who extends help. Can you recall anybody after Jesus? So you see, we always downgrade people because we don't have the capacity to really see. If they conform, yes, then he's a good citizen. But this kind of keen mind that sees and hears this is the one I'm to help. And she can help. And will, will help. And is help personified. Because without her, there would not be the Course. And without the Course, we would be religious in a fanatic way, for the most part. It's the greatest gift the Christian world has ever given to the mankind. If you look at America, you'll have to go back to Lincoln as a man more or less of the world, but who always talked about the divine, the God, the Almighty, everything. If you don't have beliefs in concept, you don't have to react to another person's belief and concept, do you? Are you there? So let their belief be whatever it is. And so long you're not controlled by yours, you can still help. Okay? So we make some deliberate attempt, deliberate, some kind that I have a responsibility to be a human being that I can be helpful in some way. So now let us see how she helps and let us see if she can help and let us see if it's a reality or is it just an idea or an ideal of hers. That's how the wise starts. Is that making sense? She said so. Now it's for me to discover it. It may be so, it may not be so. So therefore, I'm not dependent on her. I'm not dependent even on my belief. I'm only dependent on what I discover every moment. Okay? My own direct discovery. We need to awaken this faculty in us that makes the direct discovery. 
and this discovery would always be independent of the brain, the like and the dislike. Because if I subject myself to the same like and dislike, I said then that prevents the discovery. Are we relating? Okay. So we will define what help is. We all think we know. That's the block. When we know what a miracle is, we have, we have a block. Our knowing prevent us. Is that part clear? We've gone through that quite a bit. So now we think we know to help. Or you say you think you don't. I say neither of them is true. Because we don't really know the reality of it. Maybe personality cannot help. Can you see? So you have to see personality by nature must have a motive. I want to help and I want the others to notice it too. <laughs> well, no, that isn't much help. <laughs> and no personality can say, oh, I don't think that way. <laughs> so begin to discover some of the way we are manipulated by thought system that pretends to know, that pretends not to, and gets confused and so on. It's never clear. There's no certainty in it. Are you there? So to know the state of help, what that state is, beyond the thought, is to come to a state of certainty that no longer vacillates, no longer guesses, it's certain. When are you certain? Only when the light of God shines upon the brain. But we are preoccupied all the time. There's no space. Now let's say we have a yearning now to discover what is the reality of help. That what I think help is somebody, you know, I can hold their hand and lead them upstairs if they're not, they, they're weak or old. That may be help too, but it's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking that what a person does once, that that light of that help remains upon this planet forever. Because it's bringing that light to the earth. So this is extending, you understand, something of the kingdom on earth. It's not personal then. So we were talking about the other day in a very deep, serious way. What is gratefulness? So, so we said gratefulness is not when you say somebody thank you because he gave you or she and so forth. No. Gratefulness is when you have seen something and that has given you a space, a fact, a fact gives me the space, and that space discovered, discover the compassion and the perfection of creation. Then he's grateful to that what is ever there that keeps my heart beating, keeps the rivers flowing. So th the gratefulness then is not personal. It's purified, enriched, uplifted you because you made contact with the impersonal. Is that all right with everyone? We don't know what impersonal is as yet. But we have some idea that when I say thank you and I'm grateful and so forth, it's because you're offering some cookies or candies to the ego of another. But you made sure to put the cookie first in your mouth too. So you see that when I see the fact as the fact, and in fact there is no opinion, when I see the fact as the fact, there's a space. This space free the brain from all pressure. And now we have to see how pressured our brains are. More and more as we advanced towards stimulation, towards what we call success, you know, getting jobs, learning more, this scientific, that. So, you know, we get more and more pressured. There's no space to look at a tree. 
No time to go for a walk. No time even to be with our children. I mean, being with the children with that space. We have to be with the children because they'll cry and, you know, they dirty up their clothes and break your plates. But I mean to say with that other space, you know, that other space that's impersonal. And the child needs that. That's when a mother and a father is grateful, is helpful, when the child is the child of God and you're the custodians. When you're attached to the child, you're going to destroy the child and yourself. Too much pampering the child is the worst thing you can do. The Course puts it very simply. It says, the child, do only that. Don't get into, don't do this, don't do this. But when you do, then you come to a different space and you say, do only that. And then it becomes some deep understanding of the child. So, there is so much for us. And we find it difficult to make those demands. We are so pressured and some are tired. And more and more. And you know, what we need is some more relaxation. <laughs> you understand? So we are stimulating. You know, when you're stimulated, when I'm stimulated, I want more activity. I know. So it's the same brain, you and mine, not any different. When I'm in Ohio by myself, my diet changes. I want something fresh and simple. Half a cantaloupe with some cottage cheese and so, uh, it's the, no king can afford such a meal. When I'm stimulated, I don't want any silly fruit around. <laughs> yeah. They decorate the salads and that. <laughs> Give me a Coke. <laughs> it, it just, so the diet, the diet that we impose upon ourselves is another cruelty. It's the state of the mind that has its own diet. You understand? What your state of mind is, has its own, own diet. If you're worried and pressured, you know, uh, sometime martini become a part of the state. <laughs> you, you see, so it's that way. When you, you're relaxed, which is a difficult thing for us to do, but when you are, then no extra thoughts intrude upon you. And whatever the brain chatter is, you have the space to hear it. And the Course calls it, you bring illusions to truth and you dissolve them. The brain says you bring it to the truth, You're not, whatever it suggests. But we want to counter thought with thought. I said, that's the most unintelligent way. You say, that's the only one anybody taught me. I don't know any other. So, so the wise listens to the thought. Can you imagine he has the space? And this space then sorts out. And it's a function of the brain to remind you things that you overlooked. And you welcome it. Somewhere the function of the brain is to bring order in life. We get so busy out of frustrations and pressures and ambitions and fears and insecurity that we don't have the space to give to it. See that one word called help. Look how much, how much we have to. Because the brain, if we don't, if we fail to see how the brain functions, the brain doesn't have the space to receive the help. That's the difficulty. Can you see that? that the brain is so preoccupied with its knowing, non-knowing, this and that, and I don't have the space for it, huh? for the brain. What it says, I listen to it. And without the brain, I'd be totally lost. So would you. But with the brain, we are totally lost too. 
<laughs> so there's such disorder. We can become pious, we can become wicked, we can all kind of things. I see. To me, it's all meaningless. The good is not good, it's bad, it's not bad. It's right, it's not right, it's wrong, it's not wrong. Isn't that beautiful to come to that state? So then you observe it, you understand? Let it do, and somewhere, can you imagine that you can go to bed without a single thought in the mind? Stick around and you won't have a single thought in your mind. What we talk about is a state, and it is that state that communicates, not the words. I hope you didn't come to learn. It is help emerges out of silence. A silent mind helps. It extends, you know, what is of God. Compassion, perfection. It extends divine intelligence. Only divine intelligence can help, not thought. Can you imagine if our schools huh, were to awaken divine intelligence in man, what would it be like? So, to see the fact as the fact gives me the space. That space relates me with with the compassion, the perfection, you know, the grace of God. And I'm grateful. When I'm grateful, I extend gratefulness. Dr. Shukman was my teacher. And gratefulness was my first step to self-mastery. You understand? Now you and I are going to have some masteries to do. You know, you're going to take a step and master it. Once you've mastered one, all the others become comparatively easy. When I would say to her, I feel this way, I thought this. She would say, don't ever use those words again. They don't mean anything. Because your feelings are going to change. Huh? Isn't it? And your thoughts are going to change. So don't give me anything that changes. That's a whim and impulse. And you say, well, if I thought so and I feel so, it doesn't work, I don't have much to say to you. <laughs> and she would say, do you mean that? Do you mean that? Do you mean that? Oh, I know I didn't. Isn't it? Neither do you. And he said, well, now there's one more thing. I just can't say any nonsense. Can you see what I'm saying? It's just sounds of nothingness. Is this making sense, dear one? I need some kind of response. Huh? So now, my God, I was complaining about being deprived of feelings and thought, and, and now even this is gone. You don't want help anymore. 
<laughs> I longed all my life as I can remember. I wish I had a teacher. Oh God, I wish I had a teacher. Once the teacher would tell me something, I would master it. I'd do anything. I want a teacher. Well, I had Krishnamurti and he kept me away. But he prepared me. And uh, finally I have a teacher. And I used to say, oh, one guy I can meet every day. Every day something occurs to me. I want to go to the root of it. So if I had a teacher for every day, now she's willing for the every day. And I say, isn't there a Sunday in it? <laughs> what have I, why, why have I wished all these things? <laughs> and, now, and nobody was more confronting. You don't know your children. You don't know what confronting is. Yeah. You've never been in a confronting situation. Because we have conclusions. You can only be confronted when you're willing to undo your conclusions, my conclusions. So now I have Dr. Helen Shukman. And she confronts. And we have a relationship. The minute I saw her, I saw who she is. I saw who she is. And these things are very sacred and you'll start gossiping. And that's the danger. I saw who she is. Let's leave it the eternal being. And uh, so she tried to trip me over, do this and do that. No Sunday. You say anything, that's just an opinion, you're in trouble. How do you know, she says. Well, we met every day for a couple of years. And I never knew such love existed in the world. I never knew such love existed in the world. Such clarity, such love, such compassion, such perfection, non-personality, unbelievable. So now we need to know what help is. He, that's the one I'm to help. Now let's see, let's see how it's done, whether the other has the capacity to receive, will, will that, you, know, you understand now? And so there is the course, it's here to help. So we need to know a number of things about the Course at a very deep, profound level. At the level of fact. The fact that gives space, and therefore that space undoes all my knowings. Every line of the Course gives that space and silence the brain. And if our brain is not silenced when I read one sentence, then, you know, you're not making contact. It's your responsibility, you understand, to, to awaken the capacity to receive what it has to offer, the help. You have free will whether you do it or you don't do it. That's the only thing for which you're responsible. So, and gratefulness 
is the first step. You can't say gratefulness when somebody else done something. You know, then you're gratified. You're grateful when you have the space that has made contact with that what is impersonal and eternal. Then you're grateful for what transformation took place in you. You're moving towards salvation. My only function is the one God gave me. You're making space for that. So the course is Helen Shukman. She never wrote her name on it. She never touched a penny of it. And it'll be here as long as the planet is here. She never drew attention to herself. People wanted to go and ask silly question. She was very expert at giving silly answers. <laughs> She just, uh, what they call, didn't suffer fools. The minute you try to put her there, you're in trouble. You try to put her down, you're also in trouble. <laughs> uh, if you're blessed to be a student who has the ears to hear, then you're blessed for all time, for eternity. So, uh, so then roughly speaking, that they were very bright people and somewhere uh, there is conflict among them, you know, they're competitive and one day finally after some years, Dr. William Thetford said, I can't stand this anymore. Well, she's been putting that leg before and tripping him all along. <laughs> <laughs> there must be another way. She said, he's ready now. <laughs> the course is the other way. The course is the other way. It doesn't teach, it undoes. Okay, so we're going to talk a lot about the, the text, but let me first introduce you to a lesson we talked about a bit. You know, like here, heaven is the decision I must make. Well, we don't know to make decisions, you see, because the brain doesn't know to make decisions. Bra brain knows pro and con. It can't make decision. It's a decision of personal circumstances changes them. So what we call decision is preference, choice, huh? that sort of thing. And they're talking about heaven is a decision. Listen to this one. Lesson 128. The world I see holds nothing that I want. The world you see holds nothing that you need to offer you. So you have to see the meaninglessness of the world, of illusion, of projections, of images. The world I see holds nothing that I want. And then you have to see, the world I see controls me. I love my world, I like it. Can't have it both ways. The course pushes more button than I ever would. But it pushes it when you're alone and you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> this is a public affair. <laughs> it's a different thing. And also, I don't have to identify when Course talks about your insanity, your madness, your this and that. You think they're talking about somebody else. <laughs> the world you see holds nothing that you need to offer you. 
nothing that you can use in any way. But this is lesson 128. If you haven't practiced the 127 lessons, this makes no sense. But if we have practiced, we read them, but we didn't practice them. We didn't practice them because I'm absorbed in the world. That's meaningless. So I see on one side it's meaningless. On the other side it absorbs me and I forget to practice. You see, then you start either blaming something else or condemning yourself. I say, will you leave yourself alone, will you please? There's more preoccupation. Can you imagine? Nothing that you can use in any way, the world doesn't have it. Nor anything at all that serves to give you joy. And you say, my God, joy. I don't know joy. I only know pleasure. I know loss and gain. I get certain stimulation. The joy may have no stimulation in it at all. It too might be impersonal. It too might be my real nature, the essence of my being. So if it is the essence of my being, then I have to discover it, isn't it? How do I discover it? By undoing that what prevents it. So the Course is introducing us to, to the Son of God God created in his own image. And I want to learn. I don't want to know myself. I think what I know is all there is. So somehow this littleness and in one in the in the textbook they talk about your littleness will not content you because you're not little. To give you joy, believe this thought and you are saved from years of misery, from countless disappointments and from hopes that turn to bitter ashes of despair. See how strong it is, bitter ashes of despair. No one but must accept this thought as true. Now you read it, do you expect, accept this as true? In fact, when the ego reads it, it, it doesn't even identify that it's talking about me. Makes it abstract, because ego is abstract, don't you see? All what we know is abstract. Can you see? That the world we built, I call this is Canada, or this is India, you see? It's abstract concept. It has boundaries, you understand? And I'm willing to fight for India, my goodness gracious, for something abstract. So the abstract make me hate the Pakistanis. <coughs> what destroyed this wonderful country? Okay. <clears throat> no one but must accept this thought as true. If, if he would leave the world behind and soar beyond its petty scope and little ways. Each thing you value here is but a chain that binds you to the world and it will serve no other end but this for everything must serve the purpose you have given it until you see a different purpose there the only purpose worthy of your mind this world contain is that you pass it by. When you have attachments, can we pass it by? Pass it by without delaying to perceive some hope where there is none. Be you deceived no more. 
The world you see holds nothing that you want. So now, this is where we have to come in order, in order to have the capacity to receive the help. You understand whether Dr. Shukman come or Jesus come or Buddha come, Krishna Murti comes. We like what they say. You understand? And and deceive ourselves. If it doesn't introduce us to the joy, then it's a make believe. And I always think I'm gonna do it tomorrow. And one must see that whatever you whatever you postpone, tomorrow is it will make you weaker. If you can't deal with it now, you won't deal with it tomorrow either. We have become victims of the world, the world, the man-made world. Something, some divine compassion and intelligence of life is trying to save us. But where we are heading towards destruction, self-destruction, every one of us is quite dedicated to it. And then to destruction of one another. So things get messy and messy at the political level, sirs. What I'm trying to say, political level knows no peace. Okay, so leave it at that. And then, once you see that, then are you willing now to come to peace? Because peace is peace of God. If you've outgrown that the political peace doesn't exist, it's, it's a contradiction. Can you see that? And it doesn't matter whether it's America, it could be China, it could be Philippines, it doesn't matter who. At the level of politics and economy and military and so forth, there's no peace. Well, what about you coming to peace then? Are you see? So then I'm disillusioned that the external, I can't do anything about it, it's unreal, you're beginning to see the unreality of it, so therefore you don't react to it. But you do come, become disillusioned, and now, are you willing to come to peace, to joy? This is the question. So the Course deals with every single person. When every single person, you, there is only you, nobody else, you say, there must be another way. And you're determined to see things differently. And heaven is the only decision you're going to make. Nobody else is going to make it. Then you begin to get to know what the text is, what the workbook is, and what the manual for teachers is. We have something of a background now. So the text clarifies for us everything that somehow is part of our heredity even. We think there's a hellfire. Look at all your scriptures. How much fear they have put in. They have preached, crying, what is that, uh, punishment and reward. This and that. Even the New Testament, the Course, directly, in, per, in a personal direct way, Jesus said, no, they didn't know that. I could have never said that about, about Judas, that he betrayed me. How could I have said it? He is just as much a holy son of God as I am. And all the others, you see, the prophet, the scriptures, they are holy, yes. But there is so much fear they have put into us. The Sikh scripture is sacred scripture. It's Barbata. These great prophets of God wrote it, dictated it themselves. See, so it was in the 15th, 16th century. So it's there, you understand, in our time, so to speak. I am a Sikh. I spent four years on the Himalayas, consistent with the Holy Spirit of the Sikh religion. And it's sacred. But I tell you, there's so much to undo. 
you know, they have some religious ceremony. It was a very funny thing in my village, you know, and, uh, and then at the end, all the Sikhs stand up to say like the last, like the Lord's Prayer. Everybody stands up and they say, Raj Karega Khalsa, Aki Rahena And so we, we've been saying it from childhood. And this strange thing, a saint came. A saint. And I tell you something very beautiful about this saint because I had uh, contact with him. We had gone to a very holy place. This is the birthplace of the great holy prophet Nanak. So on his anniversary at this place, I am there too. But I'm sort of a what do you say? Sadhu, sannyasi, and not seeking the worldliness. I have one towel, one blanket, and what I have on. And that's all. No money, no concern, no anxiety. We wake up early in the morning to go and take a bath, to bow at the temple. We went to the saint, Next door, we open the door quietly and he's sitting erect in a different state. I think we had a little motive, the motive that he be impressed we are really serious. You want somebody to know you got up early, early, early. <laughs> What's the good of punishing yourself? <laughs> I mean, fine, you're sacrificing sleep and everything else, and God better know it. <laughs> well, since we can't get hold of God, well, here's somebody. So we opened the door, and we stood there, and he looked, and we said, Saint G, we are going to the temple to bow. Would you like to come? And he didn't say a thing. We stood there in stillness. He said, I bowed my head once, I've never lifted it since. India is the home of Christed beings. A man-God relationship is threatened in India too. Now it's man-woman relationship. And the film stars, oh God. And you know, it's just destroying everything, this acceleration. So this is the saint that's at my village. Got it? Name one saint that you have met in your life. Is there any? Have you ever produced a saint? Answer me. You can't put a saint in a closet. His light shines. Because if nobody knows him, then he gets persecuted. And then you know him. So now we come to what the text is. So the t by the reading the text, it gives me the perspective that Sikhism is sacred and yet there are things in it, the belief systems, you know, that prey upon me, you know, that have become part of my memory, racial memory, okay? And that the Quran is sacred and the Holy Prophet Muhammad brought more energy to the planet than any other prophet or incarnation. You haven't seen Islam yet. You have seen the Islam of the nomadic people. I'm the only one who talks about Holy Muhammad. So, so the Muhammad say, you're gonna go to burn this way, that way, you read the Quran. Some things are so inspiring. It is unbelievably inspiring. It stops you for days if you read two lines of the Quran. And then there is so much 
that's reactive you understand and there is so much that's reactive in churchianity all these fears of hell fires and this and that and you're the devil well i'm sure the one who tells me i'm of the devil i know who he is or she is well at any rate so reading the course it's direct it's not religious it's the light the light of true knowledge true knowledge there's no opposite in it there's no conflict in it you understand true knowledge like we say is absolute gratefulness is absolute love is absolute truth is absolute you understand rightness is absolute that what's not dependent on another it's whole in which there is no conflict the course represent just that it's for the sikh it's for the christian it's for the muslim it's for the hebrews whoever wants it so until we read the course we are not cleansed of all the belief systems all the all the the conditioning the programming from childhood if you had enlightened parents i can see that you don't need to read this that you were the child of enlightened parents and they brought you up without you know all this halabalu that goes on in the name of religion it's it won't be necessary but since we are and see, since we are full of all kind of reactions and beliefs and so forth i mean jesus does not succeed is the high priest that wins and the government the governor the 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 roman who is not even involved huh he just says i wash my hand he's irresponsible he lacks discrimination he's not a judge he's himself false and so is the collective mind can you see that the collective mind does nothing when he's being crucified and the high priest arranged it all that's not expression of religion that's not hebrew hebrew religion as high priest and that gang the one person that would have objected you know he wasn't even told one of the elders you know so all these misconceptions that cause confusions in us and we begin to fall into one belief i'm a muslim i'm a sikh you know see so it's freeing us from all belief systems so we need to read this to purify to come to a totally different perspective are you there so without this we cannot end the past so the text came first the whole philosophy of the text is nothing real can be threatened nothing unreal exist all right so now you have some totally different perspective the past doesn't bother you you don't go for this idea versus that idea but once you have come to that state you'll find gold and joy in quran you'll find it in the guru granth sahib you'll find it in the bible you'll find it everywhere but you have discrimination now it's also in the new testament the most beautiful thing on the sermon on the mount he makes it very clear that it's not for the public not for the masses he says what he says there is to his apostles if you read it carefully because the others are not going to bring it to application the apostle he demands that to bring it to application so if you're interested in bringing the course into application the text is absolutely essential because without this it doesn't make the room then after this has brought us to different perspective another background then you say but i still i'm not enlightened 
I'm, you know, a lot of the good, the baggage is thrown away, my knowing, you know, a lot of it's, I'm freed of that. I have no, no, nothing reactive towards one religion and nothing, and I'm not attached to either. So I have respect for those who were holy. I have respect for those who extended holiness. And the Sufi saints are most inspiring. I wish you knew something about the Sufi saints. Most inspiring. Their lives, their words. When a Sufi speak of Allah, it is so sacred. Allah, Allah alone is. There is only you, it says. And the Sufi said, Tu he tu. There is no other but you. You are God. You are God. You are God. You are of God. It just diminished all separation. Wait till you hear it when the saint says it. Tu he tu. There is no other but you. the power of the word of Allah, we wouldn't even know how to pronounce it. It would take us years to pronounce the word Allah right. Well, you feel it? So you will love the sacredness of the Quran and you will love the sacredness of the Bible and you will be grateful to the Course for it ended separations and opinions about anything. Huh? You're not going to like your opinions anymore. Can you imagine a human being that lives on this earth who is free of his own opinion? Is there any other liberation, sirs? Is there any other salvation? The only liberation is freedom from one's own opinions and one's own knowings. And every religion in some way inspires that. And then later on they think, we can, this group form, that group form, ours is better. Well, the minute theirs come better, they haven't heard it. It's become an opinion. Are you there? It becomes an opinion. When there is no opinion about anything, not even about your own self, then your mind is silent. A silent mind is what this retreat was to represent. The silent mind became to, came to being silent by undoing, by questioning, isn't it? It didn't say, I'm going to be silent, try it. As long as the impurities are there, it doesn't. So it must undo. Don't take offense. We have to undo. There it is. The world I see holds nothing that I want. Nothing. Because it doesn't have any need. As long as you get amused with the world that it has something, you are depriving yourself of the discovery of joy, the discovery of your own holiness. So the text is essential. Read the text. But with your heart and mind, you read it in order to give it the space to discover the truth of what it's saying. So that's the purpose of the word. And since it's the true word and true knowledge and has no opposite, it would help you if you heard it. It will bring you to that stillness. <clears throat> then later on, you would say, I wish, I don't know how to do this. It still gets the better of me. Then comes the workbook. The workbook says, read this. And it's extraordinary. It starts with nothing I see means anything. 
But you say, my God, I like this table I bought. I like this and I like that. Okay? And if you like it, if something, someone bumped into it, you're going to find a lawyer. <laughs> the whole commotion would begin, isn't it? <laughs> so then you start questioning. This li liking is a very expensive thing. Yes. <laughs> uh, how it controls me. How it diverts me. So maybe you would buy a car that could take you from here to there and you're not so attached to it. But you say, what am I going to do with my vanity? You understand? Status. So if you have Mercedes Benz, oh boy. And if a limousine requires this meaningless world, bows to it. <laughs> you understand the status? Yeah. So things no longer are used for needs anymore. You know how much we spend on cosmetics? Okay, that's part of nothingness, but it's expensive. <laughs> yeah, the cocktail hour, my goodness gracious. This one country has wasted more natural resources of this planet than all civilization put together. And the waste, and the waste, and the waste. And you're so unmindful of it. There's no reverence for anything. When you're sane, you know, when you're in this other state, I'll tell you what, when I was studying yoga, I was living alone in a place. I just had people who came and did a few things. And it was amazing that if you wanted to cook some rice, it had so much grit in it. I said, how come in, you know, in all other countries, you take the rice out, there's no grit, you want to move away. You know how terrible it is to eat rice with grit? <laughs> Not one spoon, you start spitting, that's if nobody is there, and if somebody's there, you swallow it. But the whole thing is an agony. So then we would put it on a big tray, and then we look, throw this, this one, this one, you know, and so forth. It's, it's like a bird. It takes a good half an hour. And uh, so then I see some broken rice, and you take that out too. So I say, I'm not going to eat rice anymore. Well, anyhow, we come from the north, we eat wheat. This is the southerners eating rice. But now I have this rice, you know, the, the grit and the half broken rice. And my stillness, my sanity tells me, would not allow me to waste it. So I pick it up, the broken rice, and I know a nest of ants outside. I could lecture on the rant and write a book on it. There are some things, when you observe anything, you know, what they're always busy, like you and I. You better get to know the aunt. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to really discover your own self, it's very important to see what the ants are. So, since it's part of myself, I go and put it there. And it's really hot, hot, hot as climate. But just to do the right thing is so satisfying that you would not waste. You would not waste. I'm sure that if I was eating eggs, I would not throw the shells away. There's so many things that need food. And it would be joy to break it up so the birds could come and eat it. Or the ants could. If you don't want to be related to anything. A relationship is a relationship when you have something to give, sirs. When you have something to give. It's not something you buy and give. It's some love in you that extends. It may give a thing of the earth to the earth or to the earthborn, 
But the human being is not an earthborn. We are of the Spirit. And the light of the Spirit must shine upon this plane. That's our function. That is what we are to extend. And we've gotten so sort of misdirected. So we will continue. We'll continue about what the workbook is and what's the approach to it. And then we'll come to the manual for teachers and what is the Course in Miracle and what is the lifestyle of the Course in Miracle and how does it help. When we discover how it helps, then you will extend the help also. You will have something to give. And the Course asks a question, how many teachers would it take to save the world? And the answer is one. And that one is you. So the Course offers true knowledge. True knowledge has no conflict, no duality in it. It's absolute. It's the first time you and I are going to listen to true knowledge, reading the text. And even when you, we go over the table of content, it's so inspiring, so inspiring. simple it it makes it this is a course in miracle see a fact learn how to read how to write how to be factual not with too many adjectives and this and that just fact the fact is far more beautiful than the adjectives that's just cosmetic I can describe the tree and tell you, oh, it's so beautiful, it's so nice, when I have not the ability to have you see it, and then you can say it's beautiful. We're always influencing other people with a lot of decorated phraseology. This is a course in miracle, period. So, are you interested in performing miracles, then you would insist upon it. It is a required course. Without this, there is no salvation. So, since it's required, then it is given. It's not something you can put aside. So casualness, never make contact with what it is saying. And then it says, only the time you take, it is voluntary. That's your choice. I don't want to do it now, I can do it tomorrow. But you'll have to take it. If it's not this lifetime, another one, or whatever it is. So at time level you can postpone. And this postponement, the course called sleep of forgetfulness. So you can snore a lot more if you want to. <laughs> but then it's not living. It's sleeping. This has come to waken us up to the glory of God and to your own glory, the power of your own holiness, your own sacredness. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. Well, first of all, we don't know what the will is. We know thought system. We don't know divine intelligence, you know. But we will need the will to make a decision. When you make a decision with the will in it, then intellectuality can't erase it, can't hoodwink it, 
because there's the will behind it, not the power of thought, but of the will. Okay? It cannot establish the curriculum, no. You have free will at the time level, you can sleep and doze and so forth and so on. You have to come to it. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. You see, at the time level you can say, I want to sleep, I want to be awake. You understand? I want to be whole, I want to be separated. In sleep you're separated. The Course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love. And everybody thinks they know love. Now it's going to undo all that in order to introduce us to the... <coughs> because the undoing is the extension of love. Undoing is the extension of, mis you know, of ending misperception. So, the real awakening takes place in the undoing, not in the learning. It's so beautiful, the Course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love. That's why the Course has not much to say about love or God. The purpose of the Course is to bring man to atonement which mean undoing, discovering the false. Because that already is there, so you don't need to learn it, what you already have. You see? So it, it starts undoing our notion that we are separated. Our belief system is what it undoes. It doesn't teach, okay? So it's more based on undoing than on teaching. Because all the other religions teach God, love, everything, but who knows it? So would it not be necessary then? Are they? All the religions of the world, they're sacred, they teach love, God, peace, everything. Are, are we at peace? Do you know God? Do you love anyone? Do you know joy? So then the Course comes to directly relate us to it. So then cooperate, welcome the undoing, if you're the student. If you're not the student, that's a different matter. <coughs> so this, the, for, for love, for that is beyond what can be taught. So love has to be discovered. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. Removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. So it need awareness, isn't it? Only awareness can remove the blocks. And it awakens the awareness. Isn't that beautiful? It doesn't talk about awareness. It brings you to awareness. Your awareness can undo it. When the undoing becomes a dogma, somebody else telling you, you understand? Then it's thought, you're giving authority to the other. But when on, you realize that only your awareness can undo it, it's so beautiful. You don't need you know, all the dogmas and the preachings and the whole nonsense, the circus. Your awareness can become aware of misperception. Your awareness can introduce you to the joy within you. No learning, no teaching can do that. And this is what it offers. So we have to have a very different perspective. Yeah, it does. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence. That means love is present. Love is never absent. But you are, and I are absent. Huh? Yeah. So what, what keeps me absent 
from who I am is what he deals with. It doesn't talk about Moses and Jesus and Nanak and Muhammad. No, no, it's all done. It talks about you. It's like, you know, in the Bible say, this says, if it helps you think of me, holding you by the hand and leading you. Yeah. So that the word is help. This provides that help. It's an extension of help. That's why she had to be incarnation of love and help. The one who is described. When you discover these consistencies, you say, my gosh. Then it's your awakening, your awareness. Okay. A few more lines and we're done. Which is your natural inheritance? You know, love is your natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear. So we talked about that there is love in what the universe God created and there is fear in the man-made world. If you're content in the man-made world of fear, don't read this. I think it's better not to read it than to monkey with it. We will tell you we have experimented for eight years. Some people, they want to kick themselves. Yeah, it becomes detrimental. Words lose their meaning. You lose confidence in yourself. You really become worn out. You lose confidence. You lose trust in yourself. Either you go to it or stay away. Away you are. So just make sure that with something you're going to have one relationship in your life with which you would give the best you have. You would be true to it. When you're true to it, neither Krishnamurti can disappoint you and make you react, neither Dr. Helen Shukman. And when you're true, you're a student. And a student receives the help and is forever grateful. So it says, is your inheritance, natural inheritance. The opposite of love is fear, but what is all-encompassing can have no opposite. So when you read this, every sentence brings one to having no opposite. And when the true knowledge Whatever the true knowledge is, it encompasses the wholeness. It gives you vision of wholeness. Every single sentence brings you to wholeness. Make you aware of wholeness. You understand? Make you aware of wholeness. And in that there's no conflict. And then once you're that, you say, this course can therefore be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. When we want to fit the course into our existence, no, you have to fit into the course. Okay. We will talk about the workbook and the other when we come back. Thank you for your patience. God bless you.